Hi there, and welcome to The Place. Tonight we have something extraordinary that is getting ready to happen. As a matter of fact, it's going to be happening on the outside of our studio. And I want to give you just a, a little brief um, description. It involves a lot of electricity, and that's one of the reasons I'm inside. Uh, I have a phobia about lightning, electricity, anything that goes zit, zit, zit. But tonight we have a Tesla... Tesla coil demonstration from James Haycroft. And uh, Dr. Jones is outside with him, and right now we're going to send it to them. And so brace yourselves, put your seatbelts on. We're going to have a great night. Here we are once again at the place. This is the place for intellectual, spiritual, and scriptural honesty. And we have James Haycraft with us this afternoon or this evening right. and we're going to have a fun show and so maybe we ought to introduce this show as the place for Tesla coil honesty. That's right. And so what are we getting ready to do tonight? We are going to demonstrate our uh, smaller Tesla coil that we can carry around with us. We should be able to get about 900,000 volts out of it tonight. 900,000 volts off of the small one? Uh-huh. The big one's a little bit more than that but it's a logistical challenge to move it so what uh, kind of volts do you get out of the larger one it should put out about a million maybe a million five wow and you built both of them oh absolutely you, you can't buy these things so you got to make them walmart doesn't sell them walmart hasn't started selling them yet well that's that's nice let's walk over to it for a moment okay uh, first of all let's have our crowd say hello or something make some noise <laughs> Here's the Tesla coil Yeah, crowd. we're going to test that noise up against your Tesla coil and That's see right. who wins That's out, you right. see. And so we're going to make noise. We, okay. We should be able to, uh, to do a now, this kind of looks like what I used to watch when I was younger. Not real young, but lost in space. And so explain this briefly. This is a high-voltage transformer uh, invented in 1896 by Nikola Tesla. We got to see a lot of them in the B-grade horror movies in the 40s and 50s uh, because all those uh, Curse of the Mummy and all that kind of thing had some real nice Tesla coils in them. Uh, this one is a... Uh, a copy uh, of, of one of those Tesla coils designed more for safety and reliability than absolute performance. But we're going to get good performance out of it tonight. That's wonderful. What is all of this down here? This is the switching assembly. We have to switch 20,000 volts at about 1,000 amps into this coil here. And this is not an easy thing to, to do. So all this bottom section is isolated with plastic and other stuff because uh, our voltage is so high that we get a lot of flash over and blow stuff up. So we're going to be a little conservative tonight, but we should have a good show. Is this going to be like the second coming of Jesus Christ? We hope so. We hope so. That's, right. <laughs> that's going to be fun. Now, over here, there is something that's amazing in the back of your truck that actually drives this. Let's see if we can get near that. The supply for the, uh, for, the, for, the, for the Tesla coil is a pole transformer. Uh, Let's get a shot of this. They the can't pole, hear you. Come on okay, over here. The reason is that the pole transformers are designed by the power company to live out in, in the lightning, and they can tolerate the Tesla coil. The Tesla coil blows up regular stuff. And regular stuff, it just blows it up. Oh, yeah. I, I've bought transformers to play with, and, and they just blow up. So I went. So out how many them. things have you blown up? Oh, lots. Lots. You, do you like blowing things up? Oh, well, the Tesla coil, you, if you play with Tesla coils, you get used to burned out and broken parts, yes. Yeah, I didn't know if that was a fetish of yours or uh, what. No, just uh, the Tesla coil shows off all your weak things. Yeah. We've got here, uh, we, we have people here like uh, this science guru over here, Michael Fulford, and he's been teaching all these little kids science. Is that dangerous? Uh, I think we should turn them all into Tesla coil enthusiasts like me. Yeah, I think that's good. Now let's look at this and little. We want to be, and we want to turn them into electronics engineers too, so they have to work their butts off their whole lives and don't ever get any rest, which is good. Okay. Now, during this, I, I'm going to pick and choose, and maybe someone you can guide them. I want them to hold one of those bulbs that's actually burned out. Right. And can you pick up one? We are going to show. Uh, Mr. Tesla uh, wanted to transmit the power around the world without wires, and so the the Tesla coil will easily light up these burned out fluorescent light bulbs at a safe distance away. In other words, these things don't work, but the guy holding it will be 
lit up along with this. And so, Jetta, would you volunteer, please? We can't even uh, get her he's still, I mean, come on, Jetta, you bowl. We're, we're and not he's, having good, good luck. With, okay, with can I have a volunteer? Uh, there you go. Come on over here. You've got it. Okay, now we don't Step want to up. Get very, very close, but, okay. but uh, uh, five or six feet away, we're going to be able to light these things up, no problem. Uh, we're putting out now, just to put this in perspective, we're going to put eight or 9,000 watts into the Tesla coil. We're going to put about one watt into the light bulb. So, how, how much so into this guy? Uh, well, he, he is actually receiving all of the energy, and he's what's lighting up the light bulb. Should, should somebody else be holding my cell phone? <laughs> I got mine in my pocket. Okay, sounds good. Let's light him up, okay? All right. Before we get started just out. before. Um, okay, are there any um, final words or last wishes from our audience before we all get raptured? Any, uh, does anyone want to get baptized? <laughs> I'm joking. All right. So to my children, I'd like to say that uh, I love you, and I hope I'm right about theism and that I see you uh, when this is done. And I want to let everyone know that I'm running a post-rapture dog sitting service. Uh, so dog sitting and house sitting. You know, yeah, so right. anybody that leaves that behind. It's only yeah, so you're going to be doing what, what uh, after the rapture? Um, I'll be taking care of everybody's dogs, um, houses, things like that, that everything gets left behind. Because I don't think I'm going. I, I don't want to go either. <laughs> Sounds good. Okay, let's light this, this up. Okay. Uh, Jetta, can you go over there and touch it during this? Okay, now what we're getting ready to do is to light this thing up, and it's going to be fun. And so this is our first here at the place. And so, James, take it away. I want you to pan over here and show how the bulbs are lighting up. Wow. It's getting noisy, real noisy. Pan over and get them doing the light. Okay, that was wonderful. We want to get you guys glowing with the bulbs. Can we get you guys glowing? Just get real close. Just real close. We are about to we are about a good safe distance. We're about twice as far as we can go, and that's a good way to be. That sounds good. That sounds good. Maybe we can encourage you to jump to one of these lights. Okay, would you like a stand? Okay, let's lean it up against the stand. That'll work fine. We'll let it jump to one of these lights. Now we're playing a jumping game. Okay, here we go once again. It's light up the broken light bulbs. Can you see that? Wow. That's amazing. Let's give James a hand. Come on over here, James. Do you like rock music? Of course. Of course. I mean, this is noisy. It's exciting. And I thank you so much for coming our way tonight and hooking this up. Can we have one more blast of that? And I want to see if everyone would make some noise and see who can make the most noise, okay? We're going to have to talk them into it. They've okay. been kind of quiet so far. Everybody's been a little quiet. We're going to see who can make the most noise. The Tesla coil, the Tesla coil or you guys, okay? So we're going to test it one more time with the light bulb. We'll, we'll move our bulb back just a bit and see if we can get it to a There you go. Here we go. The test of who can make the most noise. James with his Tesla coil. 
or all of these people here tonight. The neighborhood is getting excited. Yes. Okay, now James is talking over there about something. I don't know what he's saying right now. Come on over here, James. I was going to let it arc over to me. You were going to let it arc over to you? Uh -huh. Okay, go for it. Let's All see. Right. Can you get that on camera? Uh, okay. okay. Uh, Come on, Jack. Give it your best shot. He's going to take the arc. Watch. Watch the arc. Uh-oh. It got him. He took his shoe off. Ooh, twice. That's all he can handle. This guy must be nuts. Come on, James. I mean, uh, I'll tell you what, that might have cured my arthritis. Yeah, it, it, it does. You know, I, I use Ben Gay. I think this might have just fixed my arthritis. My foot been kind of tired. I think it's yeah. feeling good now. Yeah, that's, that's, that's marvelous, wonderful. Let's go inside and talk about this. We're going to talk about not just the Tesla coil tonight. We're going to be talking about the cult of honesty and the New Covenant group and what we're doing here and exploring the potentials of our future together. I've been having a lot of fun listening to the New Covenant group. Well, thank you so much. Thanks for bringing this our way, and the neighborhood loves this. They look like we're having a good show so far. Sounds, sounds good. Okay, thank you. Back to you, honey, and I love you so much. Hold on, hold on, hold on. We have one more light up. We have some more people that want to see this light up. Okay, Jack, back one, one more time. We're going to give everybody a thrill. Hold on, hold on, James. Hold on. Here we go. We're going to turn it up. Feels like it's coming after you, you know. Wow, yeah, you can feel it out here. You can also smell it too. Wow, the smell is awesome. Flesh burning and everything. Honey, it's back to you. Love you so much. Well, I tell you what, when I hear flesh burning, um, that is something that scares me as well as it should. Um, we don't believe in hell, and so I thought I was away from all that flesh burning. But uh, <laughs> you saw it. It was awesome. We saw. We actually saw James, the uh, inventor. Oh, he didn't invent it, but he created it, and he got bit tonight. A little bit. He got bit tonight by the. Of little shop of horrors. Um, they just turn on you sometimes. But we did have some folks in the neighborhood who uh, were very come out and see what in the world was going on. So we're going to have James in here in just a little bit he, uh, once he recovers and uh, they defib his heart and get it back into the right rhythm. He'll be in tonight to talk about Tesla oil. And I think it's amazing. I could not tell you um, the science behind it. But I can tell you, it was an awesome demonstration. So uh, while everybody is going um, about their business to bring things back into the studio, we will. Oh, OK. I have to use a different mic right now. No problem. See what the Tesla coil did? It just messed up our mic. No, 
No, not really. I think it's amazing, though, that we can be in contact with people that are involved in things like this. And that is one of the, the best things about the New Covenant group. You can meet so many different, you know, versatile types of people that know something that you don't. And then they can actually come in and show you and demonstrate, tell you about it. And that's that's great. Atheist and theist alike. And we don't prefer one over the other. I, I don't want anyone one to think that. Um, I, I think sometimes, you know, people are people and they have emotions and feelings and and they may say, well, you're preferring um, now, you know, theist over atheist or vice versa. But we really don't. We, we give equal opportunity uh, discussion. And so we hope to. If we don't, we want you to call us on it. We want you to say, hey, you know, I'm thinking we need more of this or more of that because we are certainly open to different uh, ideas. And that's what this New Covenant group is all about. That's what the Cult of Honesty is all about. Today, we enjoyed to have Esta Ann on my show, which is Reflections with Rhonda Jones. And we talked about modesty, and I think they're going to talk about it on the Cult of Honesty on Wednesday. And so to get differing, differing opinions on things is awesome. Someone might say something I've never thought of. More than likely, they will. And it's great. So here you go, honey. Here is your microphone. Well, we are shy, many microphones tonight, because we had to run such a long distance, actually, to get audio to the Tesla coil. So we put all of our microphone cords together, and hopefully you did enjoy uh, James's um, contraption, a Tesla coil. I mean, he got bit, right? Yeah, he did. I mean, after he turned it off, he just went over there, and it was just... And you could see it actually jolting him. So it has some residual power, you right. know, stored up, I guess. It looked like it knocked one of his shoes off. <laughs> but I mean, oh my after it happened, he went back for more. <laughs> I mean, uh, he's an awesome, awesome uh, inventor. Uh, he's Well, uh, he didn't really invent the no, he didn't, Tesla coil. No, he didn't Let's invent the honest. Tesla coil. He didn't do that, but he, he invents many different things. Sure. That, that buttress all of the, the, the different practices that he does with electronics, et cetera. Well, I told the folks that I was in here to throw the show to you, but also because I do not like things that go zit, zit, zit. <laughs> Scared of electricity, huh? I know. You know that. <laughs> I don't blame you. I am petrified it was fun. of it. Oh, my goodness. You know, Florida is the lightning uh, strike capital of, you know, I don't know if it's the world or the United States. And... I just so happened to live here, and um, anywho, so thankful he brought it. You know, it, it, it wasn't easy to bring. It takes a couple of strong backs to bring it and to do all that, and I just really thank him. He's been working for hours on it. In fact, he had to take, uh, we have a lot of electricity coming into our studio. It's a three-phase system, and he had to take a large portion of it and simply isolate it just for this event tonight. And I was thankful that he did a good job without any children being killed. True, or uh, any of our equipment being damaged. Yeah. I was afraid of that. Is yeah. that a, a stupid concern? No, or? that's a wonderful mm. concern. <laughs> okay. Uh, tonight what we're going to do is we are going to open this up for a discussion. I'm getting my phone out, and please uh, feel free... I think that I have my phone. Yes. Uh, we are going to have a discussion about the New Covenant group, the cult of honesty, and all of that, and what it means to various people. Many people feel, in a sense, and this is sad, that we are catering only to atheists. And I must brag about the atheist again, because atheists are wanting to move forward, and so they are very, very willing to be honest kind giving and all of that and so you can't put down so many atheists coming our way but you know in a sense i i think that theist 
simply because um, we have focused so much on the atheistic community, and, and they deserve that focus. They do. Uh, I, I think that theists sometimes feel as if we are, are not being fair to them. And so we want to invite you as a theist, if you're a theist, to also get involved in this movement to share what you think to be true. Now, with atheists, we always like to get into, uh, let's say, a conversation or possibly a debate, but in a kind manner. Uh, if we question something, that doesn't mean that we dislike you. It simply means that we're questioning the substance. And so uh, if you're a theist, uh, get involved in the cult of honesty in the New Covenant group. It is for you. It's designed for you and atheists alike and everything else in between. And so this is something that we want to encourage. I want to say that um, recently we, we have been watching uh, some videos from MK Skeptic and Alex Botton and really have been enjoying them because they seem to be super nice to their guests, which um, are theists sometimes. I, I agree. You know, Alex Botton is showing a lot of class. I, I would have to say that uh, MK Skeptic, uh, he's brilliant. Um, and that's true of Alex also. Um, Jim Garner is also on that show. And I, and I hope mm -hmm. that they find the New Covenant group a place that they feel comfortable with. I mean, these guys know how to really kick it up a notch. Mm -hmm. um, there's another gentleman. He's brilliant, and I love his accent, uh, Dr. Matt uh, Hunt. Mm -hmm. And he has this wonderful, wonderful, tender, tender voice. And it uh, I don't know, when I listen to him speak, I mean, it's just so, so tender toward the argument and people. Uh, I don't know. It really touches me, not just in in the context of being extremely well put together academically, but it, it touches me because he's just a wonderful human being. And so those four guys are doing an awesome job. Um, and we have been watching some of their episodes here lately. Right. And, and, and enjoying them. Yeah, I, I would invite people to tune in to what they're doing. And, you know, if you do have a show or, you know, of a podcast, etc., that needs, you know, our support or whatever, simply uh, call us at 850-572-7441. We'd love to talk with you tonight or tomorrow or sometime this week because the cult of honesty or... Uh, you know, we can say the Cult of Honesty or NCG or the New Covenant Group, all one and the same. We are simply trying to gather people for the sense of saying human beings can come together and make sense of, of what's really going on. Uh, and so that's what we're about. And so I, I would like to turn our attention uh, to some of the people here in the studio here in a few minutes. We have lots and lots of work going on on the outside. Lots of people standing outside. Lots of people in the neighborhood I start showing up. And well, uh, Jack didn't get it all on film. You know, he didn't. No, he, I mean, help. we were concentrated on yeah, the and, apparatus. And he stepped on one of the cords. It was funny. He did? Yeah. On one of and those so high had, voltage cords? No, on oh. one of the other camera cords. So we had oh. a two camera set up outside oh. and it made him feel so bad. But Jack oh. is awesome. He is our main camera guy and he is a wonderful wonderful individual and he works so hard every week just doing so many different things but uh we had it set up to where we could have shown possibly everybody but we we didn't get everybody in uh tonight and that makes me feel bad in a sense but um jack was doing what he could and so we're just dealing with several things here. And so if you do have a comment or a question, uh, please send that to 850-572-7441. Right now we're simply going to play some music for about 30 seconds. We're not going off a screen. We're simply playing music because we're going to take a break. And I'm going to kiss my wife because she is awesome tonight. Oh, my god! Wow, goodness. yeah. Is that appropriate? That is appropriate. Is that appropriate? Is it like PG-13 or? I, I don't care about all that yeah. stuff. <laughs> Somebody said, yeah. So I want to hear some music. Can we play some music up in these monitors? Up in the monitors. Thank you.
No. Mm. I felt a little. right now we're taking a slight break you need to get your friends have them tune in we're going to talk about the new covenant group uh, we may trash it for a while or whatever we're just going to have some fun tonight uh if you have a good cup of coffee uh, get it right now uh, we like starbucks uh that kind of stuff and you keep turning me on to better and better coffee i like that well, to be honest with you, I think you're the one because I'm sort of like we'll get the cheap stuff and then since you're cheap new, stuff since you're new new uh, connoisseur, you're like let's go for some of this and you've never bought anything cheap. <laughs> wow, I don't know what to say now, but you do like the Pike's Place. Um, yeah, Pike's Place is good. Yeah, that's good. Uh, we have awesome music. Uh, hopefully you enjoyed Bob's uh, show tonight. And also Greg, uh, Bray, and Bob, and also uh, Christopher Mounty, and the rest of the shows that we've had this afternoon, Clash Course. And Michael Fulford had his show on today at 2 o'clock. Um, he's doing a wonderful job just sitting here in the studio, just teaching all the kids. I like that, you know just science class going on all the time so if you have a friend question whatever get them involved in the show tonight we're going to wait around for a few minutes let's crank the music up We're going to leave the music playing for a little bit longer, but tonight, if you would like to Skype in or anything like that, you can get a hold of Joey. Just say, hey, I want to be connected, and he will get you on, or put it on Sean. Sean knows how to do that, uh, or Matthew, or Jack, the rest of these guys. Make them work hard. Make them earn all of that free money. They don't get paid around here. Not worth it. Not worth it. So unworthy. Look at this guy. Sean's picking up the camera, the entire tripod, all at the same time. You, I mean, come show off your muscles while the music's playing. Come on. Okay, he's just laughing.
guys hear me okay now we can hear uh we are having one of those bob graves conundrums with the audio uh we do lack equipment here and so you guys are going to have to be patient as we grow and we do not brag about having the best studio in the world but one of the things that you have to know about the new covenant group we spend our money wisely that is we take just basically toothpicks and we start putting things together to where everything comes together and it's been working and we've always uh, just taken the least and made the best out of it and to me that's marvelous wonderful what do you think well you did just confess to um, drinking starbucks coffee instead of like great well, value i'm talking about what we do in the new covenant group <laughs> but when we do it unto ourselves we're very very greedy <laughs> yeah, and right. spoiled and all of that and yeah, so sure. we mm -hmm. wear all of these nice things oh, and someone right. was really bragging about my hat uh saying that i outdid um alan alan yeah so they like my hat tonight. That's so I thought subjective. that was. I do like your hat, but it's not as colorful as Alan's hat. Okay. Okay. So it's more in the lines of that uh, German oh, yeah. type October Ma Michael Fest has one. He turned hat. his head. Uh, yeah. Go ahead and style it, Michael. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. He has a or nice. Or like a feather. Swiss Alps type. That's thing. that's really nice. Uh, James, we did enjoy the show outside. It was wonderful. Um, yeah. It was Absolutely. awesome. Awesome. Yeah. Yep. Yep. And so tell us a little bit about this Tesla coil, some of the things that, you know, the rest yeah. of us who are like not geeks in this context. What prompted you to want to make one? Uh, my mother had me all groomed <coughs> to be a doctor, and I saw a demonstration put on by Moody Bible Institute, and this guy had a Tesla coil that he stood on top of, and 10 feet of fire come out of the tips of his fingers. I wanted to know how Tesla coils worked rather than becoming a doctor, so uh, I went into engineering instead. Uh, that one is about a. That one is a is a six inch coil, about seven hundred, eight hundred thousand volts, according to my simulation. Well, how long did it take you to build the large one? Oh, years, because every time I'd put it together, I'd blow it up. <laughs> maybe so, maybe you should have been a doctor. Uh, well, so I would go back and uh, and take care of all the smoked, burned up, killed parts, and go buy a new parts so I could go yeah. reduce those into slag too. You know? oh, what that, do your neighbors think about all of these explosions? Oh, thank goodness I'm kind of out in the in the in, in the middle of nowhere where uh, the neighbors don't get too wound up when they hear explosions and stuff. How does this affect the animals where you live? Uh, they all hit the road. They, they know what bad stuff is, and, <laughs> and the, you don't ever see anything around. Yeah. Plus, uh, 
it, I operated in inside, and uh, it makes a lot of uh, ozone and uh, nitrous oxides and stuff, and really got that sharp smell to it, kind of like bleach. Yeah. You know when you got too much when you can smell it. Mm. Yeah, I could smell it. I was mm. downwind. Mm -hmm. uh, I felt as if all of that was actually coming my way, not just the smoke, but it, you know, the visual of it. I said, "Wow!" And the I magnetic was, field, of course, affects you. Uh, yeah, I was holding the microphone, and in. it it did. Yes. And Jack said, "I can feel it," and mm -hmm. I said, "You're right, Jack." And I'm closer to it, yep. and so it was. It was amazing. Uh, if if you would have had it on for a longer period of time, what would have happened? I operated un under such stresses and strains that uh, it can only operate a short period of time, or else it would fail. Okay. okay. If something would just give up, probably the capacitor. Okay. The capacitor that we were looking at was uh, uh, about 50 or 60 uh, $10 a piece capacitors. And uh, that's the best I've, and cheapest solution that I've found to the capacitor now. Mr. Tesla used wine bottles filled full of salt water, but <laughs> Much they're cheaper. awfully bulky. Let Much me cheaper. Let me ask you this. Um, how much copper do you have in that? That has uh, about 600 pounds of copper in it. Do you know what that is on the market today? <laughs> now, that's counting all of it. That's the pole transformer in the back of the truck and everything else. Mm. Wow. I think some of the folks in the neighborhood would love to get their hands on that. Oh, yes. <laughs> so that's one thing that Pensacola is famous for, these guys you know, drive around in these trucks. What do they refer to themselves um, as? Uh, scrappers. Yeah, scrappers. They, scrappers. They like to do scrapping. Well, when they steal the copper, they're known as thieves. <laughs> and I, I, I don't want to go agree. all Kurt Cameron and uh, Ray Comfort on you, but when you steal the copper, you're a thief. <laughs> <laughs> and they do that a lot. We, so then you send coppers after the coppers. The copper th thieves. So you send a, the so the thieves steal copper, and then you send coppers after the thieves who stole the copper. Exactly. Just, just checking on so that. So you send the cop check for those that cop the copper? Yep, there you go. They're, they're copper coppers. <laughs> copper copper coppers. Let's, let's focus for a moment on Michael. He's, you know, he's giving us a hard time tonight in a sense, and he's wearing a nice hat, maybe better than mine. Uh, but uh, you've started a new show, and it's called The Atheist Half Hour, and you're actually spinning, give or take, a little bit longer, sometimes shorter than that. Uh, tell us how, to, how it's going. Uh, well, I'm uh, looking forward to hearing feedback. Mostly, uh, like today, I was expecting 30 minutes and ended up being an hour, so uh, sometimes I don't have quite enough ready. Uh, but it's mostly what it is is I'm, there's stuff I read, there's stuff I think about that, and it's kind of a, uh, just me talking about the things that bother me or stuff that I think about that I think, well, this here's something like if you listen to yourself talk, you end up learning more about what you're thinking yourself. And that's mostly what it is. Uh, when I can get to work and get fee hear people's questions or find out more information from people and start getting feedback, I'm going to start making a little more re interactive, more responses to people as ask questions, especially as an atheist show. I'm not uh, schooled like uh, Greg Bray is, or other members of the, or other hosts you have on the network. So, uh, anybody asking me questions, I, I would engage on them pretty much on their level. Right. You know, one of the things that I like about the New Covenant Group is we have attracted a lot of academics, and uh, it's it's wonderful. But not just academics, but we find that we have attracted a lot of people who want to get involved, not just in the conversation, but the various studies. Uh, a lot of people don't have the time nor the money to actually uh, attend a university, uh, and maybe at some point they will. But, you know, the Internet is a wonderful place uh, today. We have the advantages of being able to read and read and read and read. And so this is helping a lot of people to investigate things that they've never been able to investigate before. And so we're in a much different world in a sense it's like the world is our university classroom, and we have many, many teachers out there. And um, you can get them online. Uh, and in fact, I have found that uh, various professors um, from wonderful, wonderful schools um, are actually putting a lot of their teachings on YouTube, which is great. And so I applaud 
uh, anyone who would encourage their children, especially if you are homeschooling your children, please, please don't limit them to what you understand. Uh, give them uh, the advantages of excellent professors everywhere. And I would encourage you, if you send your children to school, and I'm going to plug something for a minute. If you send your children to school, let's say uh, elementary school, or possibly middle school or even high school. One of the things that I've always been dogmatic about is no homework. And the reason that I've always been dogmatic about no homework, it's because when children are young, if you work them out real, real hard at school for eight hours, if the teachers are actually doing their jobs well, when they go home, they don't need mm -hmm. to go home and listen to mom and dad tell them how to do algebra or whatever wrong. They need to go home and have a relationship with their brothers, sisters, and aunts and uncles and kids in the neighborhood. But, you know, this, this is troubling me these days. And, and so I want to have just a, a short discussion on this because this last year I called because they were picking up children in our neighborhood at 540 every morning. And those kids did not get back to their home site until after six o'clock in the evening. That's a long day. And it's then ridiculous. when they did get home, they had homework on top of that. And so my question is, that's not reasonable. We don't need to teach people to bring their home, you know, all of their work home. We need to teach people how to, you know, keep their work on the job, so to speak. And so I'd like to get your thoughts on this because I'm an educator, and um, I have found that, you know, if you, as an educator, if you do your job right in the classroom, and, and that's very depending on the kind of school setting that you have, and a lot of school systems, unfortunately, they are simply there babysitting children instead of educating. But if you have an opportunity to teach kids, teach kids, and when they go home, don't give them a lot of homework. Now, I understand that on a college level, you can give college students, university students, a homework, and this is very appropriate. They need to do that kind of work. But young children, they don't need that laborious task. And so I'd like to get your thoughts. And since uh, you're our age, uh, I'd like to hear from, from you, uh, James, first. I always thought that, that homework, loading the kids up with homework was counterproductive. Uh, my, my child was... Uh, public schooled and and they they did that and and i always wondered if they just were didn't teach it in the classroom and hoped that the kids would pick it up at home and uh so of course i was always like uh i wonder if this is a test for the parents you know do i know this stuff but uh does the teacher know, know this stuff <laughs> it makes you question that's right. yeah that's a good point uh randy we haven't heard from you what are your thoughts well having uh two teenage boys in uh high school right at the moment. Think about it quite a bit. The last several years, I've had problems with them uh, not doing well as far as their grades. Test-wise, learning the material and so forth, they did great. Their problem was they weren't completing their homework. And their homework is the reason that they had poor grades. They got the benefit of the classes, they understood the material, but by the time they got home, they were just you know, so frustrated or disinterested uh, you know, trying to be the responsible parent, you got to try to stay on to them to make sure that their grades are where they're supposed to be. But I do agree. They, the, t the people that are teaching these classes are not making it interesting enough that the kids want to learn. Um, they're getting as much as they're going to get out of it in the classroom. If they're not getting it with somebody there to guide them, how are they going to get it at home by themselves? Right. You know, my wife and I, were very much in favor of classical uh, education. Uh, and it is basically broken up into three different parts. You have the knowledge provision years. And, you know, the kids simply go and, you know, they memorize different things and they're provided knowledge. And then you have the years which would be called, and I will keep it simple rather than going into Latin, but it's... It's simply the logical years. In other words, you're taught how to use logic. In other words, you're taught knowledge first, 
and then you're taught how to be critical about that which you have learned, that it is about what you know. And then the third phase of classical education is actually the rhetoric part. You're taught how to write and speak efficiently concerning what you logically can put together concerning the knowledge that you do have. That's not to suggest that there isn't a lot of knowledge provision as you go along, but you, you learn how to deal with all three aspects at the same time by the time that you graduate from high school. And so I'm very in favor of classical education. And so if you are a homeschooler or, a, you know, if you have your children in homeschool, check out some uh, various curriculum that would support a classical, uh, the classical trends because it will give your child many, many, many advantages. And it, and it gives more of a scope and sequence that's reasonable and rational that will stay with the child. For instance, I, I have found that looking into... Uh, for instance, someone asked me to look into the Abeka book system. That is actually uh, written and published here in Pensacola uh, by Pensacola Christian College. And I, I looked at their algebra program and I said, this is extremely failed because what happens, the mechanics of that particular uh, textbook, if you follow it, um, it it's, it's like learning this and then you jump into something else and you never come back to the premise of the second portion and, and, and you lose track. And I, I think that, you know, a good textbook has enough redundancy to where it's always gathering, making and forcing the student always to go back. Or, you know, a, a good teacher will not be just a textbook teacher, but one who can you know, go well past the textbook to where they can actually grab and, and lead the child down the road appropriately. But I, I think that a lot of parents are relegated to simply using, you know, the textbook as their guide because, you know, let's admit this, you know, most parents are not uh, disciplined in, in every discipline that, you know, a child needs. And so they are very much... Educators. Exactly. So they just shove the book in front of them and say, read this. It must be right. It's like the Holy Bible. It's the inerrant Holy... Well, I'm stepping on toes here. Okay. Um, if you have some thoughts on this, uh, send your thoughts in. Uh, we can do that in various ways. I, mean, um, I have a thought on what we were talking yeah, about. I'm um, sorry. That's okay. Um, I do believe that that um, kids or children are given too much homework from what I can tell from the grandchildren. But I also have a, another train of thought on that. I, I think that when you bring something home that you did that day and you write it out, you know, over and over or you, um, you know, well, just practice makes perfect. And so... Maybe just for me, I even you know, going to college, when I got home, uh, above and beyond the homework, I had I was a student that had to, you know, write it over and and it sunk in better if I just wrote it over again, wrote my notes once or twice, and so, you know, I can see giving children children things to do, um, you know, 15 minute, go over this, uh, let your parents you know, go over these sight words with you or whatever. You know, I do believe that. And so there's a happy medium, I think. Um, I, I don't, you know, too much homework is a well, negative. I'll put it to you this way. You know, when, when you have young children and you work them out for as many hours as they are worked out in the school system, it it seems like that they should be able to, approach that and say, you know, this has been done in an appropriate way and we'll get back to it tomorrow. And if we do this five days a week, that should be a, a, a very thorough thing for each child. Now, if you start taking all of that home, you know, what it turns out to be is uh, it's not going to follow in the same vein as with a good instructor or teacher or professor. And so I, I think that a minimal amount of, 
you know, X, Y, or Z would not hurt, but that's not what we're seeing. We're seeing, you know, children having to work two, three, and four hours uh, in the evening and it's just... Because of that standardized testing. That standardized testing is always a problem that because the teachers teach the test and they, they, don't, exactly. they, don't, they don't teach the straight lesson. When I went to school, we didn't have standardized testing. They just taught you algebra or English or whatever that you were being taught that day and that's what you were taught. And, yep. you, and, and you were tested on it at the end of the six weeks or semester or whatever. Whereas the standardized test, the entire year is spent on teaching the test. Uh, you know, the military has standardized tests, and you know, you'll be in class and the instructor will say, write this down, it's going to be on the test. You'll be like, okay. Now, I have found as a teacher, over the years when I'm teaching students, one of the things that I'm painfully aware of is that... Uh, for instance, if I have a class of 25 students, I can speak to that class and not every student will understand me equally. So, And so what I've done over the years to learn how to get all of the students on the same page, I've required of my students to do something that I think is the best way to test them. In other words, the best way to test to see if a child or say when I'm teaching Greek or Hebrew uh, if you know what I just taught, you should be able to turn to another student and teach them that material. Absolutely. Right. And so right. when, when I've taught children in the past, I've had children turn to other children and use different words and teach them something that maybe I missed. You know, because sometimes in our usage of language, sometimes we talk over them or they just miss a point or we speak too rapidly but their friends they pick up on something and they will go wow i can share it with you yeah, and so it's this about the presentation you you didn't exactly. miss uh, you know something that was on the scope and sequence but you missed the presentation wasn't what that one child needed exactly so to me as a teacher i see that a teacher has such an advantage of utilizing all of the children in the classroom if you have five children missing the point, you can get the other children to help teach because if they know it, they should be able to teach it. Mm -hmm. And I'm not talking about going A to Z. I'm just saying if, if, if I've taught, say, uh, something about, you know, um, you know, aquative verbs or, or something about ergative verbs, you know, certainly we should have some, you know, some students in that classroom who should be able to turn around and teach the other students how that you know is and what it means etc and so I have found that to be very very useful and so for some of you guys who are homeschooling you might try that you know one of your children may be getting your point you might have that child speak to your other children and say hey this is my perception of it and this is the thing that I think is that is really unique and genuine about the New Covenant group it's it's that we're doing in principle uh, what I've always done in the classroom. Well, there's a you model. Um, I'm not sure what the technical name is, but I've always heard it referred to as see one, do one, teach one. You give a basic demonstration of what it is. Then you have the, the students replicate that as best they can. And then when they have some understanding, have them teach it to someone else. Because in teaching it to somebody else, you're making it more concrete in your own mind. So I've got to it, know it to, to be able to, to teach it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. I would say that uh, the problem with homework is they use it as a teaching method. Right. You'll have the teacher stand up in front of the class, read the lesson, and then, okay, and here's what I want you to do for homework. And then usually the homework is what ends up being on the test, not the actual lecture. Uh, and uh, one of my, the way I would see it is homework should be able something that reinforces what was taught that yes, day. Yes, exactly. Should not take in a ridiculous amount of time and should be done fairly quickly and it only should be reinforcing what was already learned not covering new material when the teacher is sure. not there to assist a student on learning not to you know really uh, do the job of the teacher when they're the teacher is not there to teach or inform the student I did have a teacher like that uh, who he would stand up in front give the lecture. The lecture had nothing to do with what was in the book. The book itself was what was being tested on. And maybe the lecture is interesting, but 
you know, if you take notes, if you follow along in class and then don't do the homework, which you are supposed to do, of course, but if you don't do the homework, uh, you'll be out in the cold when it comes time for the test. You know, I have found that uh, kids and even adults, uh, they get bored about a particular subject uh, if they don't understand it. And so it's a challenge being a teacher uh, because the challenge is if you want you know, the students to like it, you've got to make sure that they understand it. Because once you can understand, for instance, algebra or English or, you know, let's say a foreign language like Greek or Hebrew, once you start understanding it, it's, there's something about understanding and principle that gives you that ability to just really like something. And that's when it starts just really taking over. And this is what I think that happens in, in the atheistic mindset and once again theists don't get upset from me saying this but I think the reason that atheists like science so much it's because they understand it they understand the method and the practice of it and they can appreciate it and I think that if more theists would look at science for what it is without exaggerating it and and start uh, if, if they could understand it I think that they too would applaud it and enjoy uh, the methods and the practices. What are your thoughts? Of course, I come out of a scientific engineering type background and, and to me, things like math and science are something that everybody needs to know because we're always asking questions, well, is it gonna rain, you know? Well, we can look at the weather channel and see what the weather fronts are doing, et cetera, et cetera. Or, you know, something like playing with the Tesla coil there. How does that thing work? Well, you know, you have to know all these scientific principles behind it. So uh, I've always felt that way. And, of course, you know, Stephen King did, too. If you read the the stand there, you know, all the techies were the, the bad guys, you know, and all the artists and the spiritual people were all the good guys. And that is a common theme. The scientists were always the bad guys in film. I hate that. All the bad guys were the techies, and I, I just thought that was hilarious, you know. But, um, you know, with, with what you were saying there, um, gosh, my brain just... Oh, you're getting old. Yep, I'm old. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, can we stop and, and do something? Um, Michael, come over here for a moment. Okay. I'm going to put you on the spot. Uh, but this this is really unique. I'm going to have to move this Bible because... I, I picked up my Bible because I thought that I was going to have to uh, explain something about my opinion about the Tesla coil. So I picked up my Bible because, you know, it's my standard for truth. <laughs> That's a pun. Come on. Now, this guy has on some boots. And uh, if you haven't seen boots like these, you haven't seen boots. And so I want a close-up of these boots. Now, while we're looking at your boots, Michael, I want you to tell us about these boots because they're awesome. Well, they're nice cowboy boots. My mom got them for me, uh, which, you know, always ask your parents for things. They'll get it for you no matter how expensive it is. That's right. And uh, they, well, I mean, what more can you say? They're awesome cowboy boots. And so let me get, get this straight. You tuck your pants in so everybody can see the detail at the top. Uh, that's what I thought. This is Pensacola now. Now, yeah. now, tucking your pants in does what? It shows the detail it's, on the it top. It shows off my boots so you can see them. Because otherwise you won't be able to see them. Duh. You'd think he had on flip-flops. They're just leather <laughs> coated. <laughs> so right. should we start tucking our pants into our socks? If you swing that way. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> or ride a bike. <laughs> nice boots. Hey, she has I good like taste. I like the boots. Yeah, I mean, good taste. Yeah. Good taste, Mom. If you're watching, you were asking, you were mentioning that atheists are more interested in science. Well, one thing too is, is with science, you have really solid demonstration of science, uh, like with the Tesla coil out there. Okay, you make all these predictions, you make all these statements, you make all these plans, and you work on it, you develop it, and you exactly. apply it, and you get an actual result. Scientific method. The sci through the scientific method. And I got to say, that was cool. I've not actually seen one in person before. 
And that, I, I almost, even though I'm standing there, I'm still thinking, this guy has got to be a special effect. <laughs> <laughs> well, they used to be, I guess, in the old movies, right? They, uh, one of the most famous ones uh, was used in a bunch of the Hollywood B movies, like uh, uh, The Curse of Fu Manchu and Dracula's Third Cousin or something, all those movies made in the 30s and 40s that had Boris Karloff in them. And uh, sure, they tried to tack it in there because uh, they, uh, the special effects guy was named String Fadden, and he always called them Arky Sparkies. So he just had this stuff set up. So all the stuff you see when you watch the movies, all the lights and sparkly things, that was all those stuff. Well, that's fascinating. Well, uh, if you have any comments or questions, we are here to answer well, some of these. We, we do have. We uh, do. We okay. do. We do. Okay. Uh, we have two, and they just came in immediately once. Okay, a little bit of different spin. Um, one person says, are you or are you not a member of the Am Amish Mafia, Michael? <laughs> I can neither confirm nor deny. Okay. <laughs> And the other one was, when did Michael join the Amish? <laughs> <laughs> uh, again, I can neither confirm nor deny. Same question asked several different ways. That's right. <laughs> the psychological tests. Well, he was out there the electrical. Yeah. That's right. Well, I mean, I, I can't go into details. <laughs> <laughs> we have a... a a like, witty, yeah. a couple of witty, witty commenters. Hmm. I had kind of a comment about the, uh, the comment, I forget exactly who said it, but talking about the uh, scientists being portrayed or the techies being portrayed mm. as the bad guys. And always. that is a common theme. Mm. Uh, you know, look at the movies in the 50s. It's always the mad scientist. And if you think about it, it's always something that we don't know is being portrayed as evil, unknowable. They'd never pre, you know, presented the what the scientist was studying as something that was attainable. So therefore, it was evil. It was black magic. Mm. Um, kind of the, uh, the God of the gaps. If you don't understand it, put something mystical in there to fill in the gaps. Yeah, well, the thing Just is on the negative too, sense. Well, I was going to say, if you watch Star Trek, it used to be a lot of the uh, episodes would have some kind of scientific explanation of things. Even Kirk, for all that he always somehow lost his shirt, was still very knowledgeable, very uh, somewhat scientifically literate. You had uh, Spock and McCoy that would uh, edge off his personality, but still, Kirk was intelligent. You saw him, uh, one of the episodes, he's fighting a reptile, reptilian, the Gorn. The Gorn, yeah. yeah I, was, yep. I didn't want to say it immediately, because I wanted somebody else, to, oh yeah, he doesn't know. I do know. but uh, We're all Trekkies. <laughs> but he makes a, a, a weapon uh, from his scientific knowledge of elements of sulfur and all these different things. If you watch the new movie, how does he fix the warp reactor? He kicks it. <laughs> you do, it, and it's one of those things where it's more of an action movie now. It's no longer, the, and the reason why a lot of atheists like Star Trek is a very humanist, very pro-human knowledge, pro-human uh, compassion series. Even the impossibilities are explained scientifically. Right. The the Heisenberg uncertainty um, rectifier or something like that yeah. was something that was used well, in the transport system. Uh, it's one thing that people have always said. You know, it's a reason that the transport system can't exist because, according to the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, you can't know the location and the velocity. speed uh, yeah. or velocity of a particle at the same time with any certainty. Um, so therefore, you're having to map all that in this transporter. So they had a, you know, they created something to, mm -hmm. you know, to explain it. it. Just amazing. It's not something that you're going to find in your, you know, usual, you know, B-movie science fiction. Well, that's where we learned all about antimatter, you know. That's yeah. all, ever, all I know about antimatter came out of Star Trek. Well, if you look at it, too, I mean, if you look at the original crew of the Enterprise, you had Sulu, who was Asian. Uh, and by the way, George Takai himself is awesome. He's a very cool person. You should follow him on Facebook if you don't already. Uh, you had a Russian, uh, who a fellow's name I cannot remember at the moment. I feel Chekhov. bad. Well, Chekhov, but yeah. I can't remember the actor. Yeah, Boris um, something. Uh, yeah, I can't remember his name. He, he, he himself, he's also a very cool person. You have uh, uh, Nichelle Nichols, who the lady who played Uhura. Right. Uh, and they even let this douchebag on. I mean, how often do you see somebody allowed 
a, a person like that, Shatner. <laughs> I'm not a Shatner fan. I'm a Star Trek fan. I'm not a Shatner fan. Uh, but you had all these people that were involved on the bridge crew of the Enterprise at a time when we were still going through the Cold War. Walter Koenig. Uh, we had the uh, race riots were still going on. In fact, Nichelle Nichols, and I'm probably saying her name wrong, has a very uh, moving story about her meeting Martin Luther King Jr. and finding out her actual role, uh, role on the show. She did not know that her role was, one of the, was actually a command position until Martin Luther King himself told her what the position was. And that's something that sci-fi is supposed to be about, or, or to me at least should be about. It, it's always you have the new technologies, you have the new things that we're able to develop and what might be possible in the future. My, I mean, some of it's fantasy. Doctor Who is much more science fantasy. But you end up with this idea of, okay, here's what we can see as being possible in the future. How do we as humans adapt to it? How do we use it? And uh, that's why I'm kind of disappointed with a lot of new sci-fi that doesn't have that role. It's just, look, explosions! It's well, we don't travel. have Gene Roddenberry to write it anymore either. Well, yeah, that, and that's part of it. We have uh, another comment that's come in, and it is your mother, Michael, uh -oh. and she's thanking <laughs> us for having you model the boots, and so before we end tonight, we may have you do that again, Oh, joy. because I think it may become, you know, viral, uh -oh. uh, modeling those boots. Uh, however, uh, let's move this diet. discussion uh, a little bit further down the road uh, with... The idea of the New Covenant Group, I want your ideas about the New Covenant Group, James. I mean, what does it mean to you? I came uh, here to uh, listen to the discussions about the atheists and the theists because that's always been uh, one of my pet peeves is that where I used to work, we had about 50 people, and uh, all, the, all of us atheists had to, had to hang you know, quiet because uh, we would get ganged up on by the rest of the group, but you couldn't have an intelligent conversation with them. And uh, I was telling uh, somebody the other day, we, were, we had the guy Skyped in, the uh, determinationalist or whatever he was there, and I, you know, I thought that guy had a lot of, had a lot of guts to uh, show up on, you know, in, in front of all of us, and uh, you know, I, I just love it. I, I've had more fun, this is, this is great fun for me. I, I agree with you. You know, one of the things that my wife and I keep experiencing, and, and uh, it's something that we've never experienced in our life. Um, we have come to the point to where we're not even looking at the label any longer, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we are just wanting to understand who people are, what they think to be true, things of that nature. and. You know, the idea of being a theist or an atheist is, it's almost become meaningless uh, in a sense to us. What are your thoughts, honey? I, I think that's a, a perfect way to look at people. Um, you know, even as to Anne, I, I don't know if she's a, a believer, non-believer. You know, today I, I picked up a few little uh, hints, but... It, it didn't come to my mind to find out and so it, it used to you know uh, did they believe in God didn't believe in God whatnot but now it's it's more about the person themselves instead of you know who or who they don't represent you know I I remember back when we were very very uh, much involved in the church and I will say that when we were involved in the church, I think that theists dislike theists who don't agree with their form of theism. They dislike them more than they do uh, dislike atheists. I, I would agree with that. Yeah, and it, that, that's the troubling thing about theism in my opinion because if you take a Christian and you ask them about an atheist, they have an opinion. If you ask them about a Muslim, my god do they go off the wall and if you ask them about a hindu it's you know, you know the rapture is going to take place um, it's it's strange there is so much hatred and animosity so much division within christianity uh within theism and um i'm, I'm told also that within the atheistic community 
there is a lot of division. And mm -hmm. we've had atheists who have said, wow, the thing that we do like about the New Covenant group, we don't feel the urge or we don't feel compelled to bash people. We don't want to, you know, just come in here and just start making insults against theists. But it's, it's about a conversation that you can have and be relaxed be who you are and really get to know one another. And, and to me, that, that is so, so good. I went to a meeting at the at the UU church out there on 29 one time, the uh, atheist group, but their basic thing was they just wanted to go bash the Bible. And, uh, and you know, I was like, well, that's pretty easy, you know. Let's talk about other stuff, you know. We don't need to, everybody does, bashes the uh, Bible, so we yeah. should be able to pick out something that talk about that's not like that. Well, one of the guys there was a, he must have been, been a physicist or something. You know, we got to talking about uh, uh, free will. And uh, of course, which I don't believe in because being real technical, uh, I don't think I have free will. And uh, the reason is, is that if I'm gonna go buy, see we all got smartphones here. If I was gonna go buy a phone, I have to go look at all the specifications and battery life and all that mundane details. Whereas by the time that I get this all hashed out, I really think that I've just got one option to to do and uh, you know one phone to buy that's going to be my phone I don't really think I have free will I don't think I could go buy one randomly and be happy with it I probably could I'm pretty persnickety I got it now. <laughs> but, uh, are you saying your genetic makeup causes you to be so specific and precise and, and, and I, th I think it's training and uh, uh, I, I worked with uh, the flying machines for such a long time and and you really can't have any mistakes whatsoever because somebody gets killed sure. so we're, we're all like doesn't matter how long it takes to make it work it's got to be done perfect the first time with no mistakes but we would have three people working and five people looking over your shoulder to make sure that you did it right, right. and uh, of course well, that didn't bother me but that bothered some people uh, did, did you work on airplanes at any point in your life oh yeah worked on uh, Air Force Air airplanes. Uh, let me. Can I ask you a couple of questions? Sure. Okay. I'm not going to tell you what this has to do with anything, and hopefully no one can guess. But I'm just curious. How hard is it for a plane, a large jet, to fly at, let's say, 600 miles an hour, say at 50 or 60 feet above sea level. The uh, G loads that the aircraft has to pull to uh, ha to maintain that that altitude at those low altitudes is, is nothing but in incredible. The uh, Air Force pilots having to fly the uh, F-111s in that's what they were going to attack at about 500 feet at about 600 miles an hour, and the pilots would be sick and bruised when they would get out of making test runs. So you're saying if you had a plane and you were flying, say, 50 feet above the ground at, say, 550 to 600 miles an hour, the G... It's just like being in a portion. cement mixer. I mean, it, it literally, you are covered with bruises and you pull your straps as tight as you can, but your straps have bruised you uh, and... Uh, it, so it's almost impossible unless you've been trained to experience those. These guys have a philosophy that if you, uh, the more you sweat and practice, the less you bleed in combat. And so everything that they've ever done, they've gone out and practiced hundreds, if not thousands of times. Now I can take a Cessna and land a Cessna. I can do that. Done it. Good for you. Okay. Now, uh, I don't know if I can do it at my age now, but I've done it I'll before, but I would bet that I could do it again. But my, my question would be, how different would that be and me getting into one of these major, major um, big planes, you know, one of these big jumbo jets. Oh, well, now the big jumbo jets are just nothing but easy. Uh, they're designed to be flown by just basically anybody, and uh, they've got one switch that you can set that they just take off, fly to altitude, fly to Paris, and, and, and land just for you. And you don't have to do anything except just sit and watch it the whole time. But when it comes to landing, would it uh, be they'll simple? They'll land themselves nowadays. They will. They wow. can use the GPS and uh, the other sophisticated sensors on. 
Wow, that's interesting. I'm going to come back to you because I want to ask you several more questions about aviation, but I don't want to get into any particulars. Um, I have a comment when you mentioned going to a meeting and you know most of the atheists mm -hmm. just wanted to bash the Bible, mm -hmm. and, and I'm not sure how, how you know you, you meant that. Um, I could only just imagine, but to me, uh, unless they were you know prolific in uh, you know original languages and, and linguistics and everything, that would be to me like everybody in here bashing uh, the world-renowned brain surgeon. Don't you think? I, I, mean, I thought the same way. And uh, see, that's when, remember my first question that I got in, in here that I ever asked Dr. Jones was, uh, well, how do we know what the, because uh, he, he was talking about Corinthians or something, whatever he's working on. And I was like, well, how do you know what the original is, you know? And uh, he never even answered. And so uh, I was like, uh, so I thought about that a lot. and. Uh, I've learned a lot out of here. Of course, we really have no way of, of knowing what the Bible ever said because now it looks like a lot of it was written with people with specific uh, access to, to grind, specific ideals. And they're, of course, are going to erase the original manuscripts or get rid of them. So we only have what they wrote. It would certainly be nice to have some idea what came out maybe a thousand years ago, what was written down. But that's all gone. We'll never get to see it. And so, to me, the Bible bashing was just too easy, because after all, we can just grab the Bible and start reading out of it any anywhere, and, and some of it's fun, and, and some of it is so far-fetched that it's, uh, you know, you just can't think, well, this just can't be. I spent the better part of a year working on a plimpsis, and what that means is it's actually a text that has been, it's a manuscript that, for the most part, Someone said, well, I don't need the Greek text. I just want to write my sermon notes on it. And so since it was found, it was an incredible task of just trying to recover what was underneath, you know, um, that is these sermon notes. And so a lot of people really don't understand the detail and the work that goes into reconstructing the text physically, number one, and nor do they understand what it means to admit to the facts of what is there. And I, and I think that my, my wife was leading to a particular question, which I would like to hear you know, some uh, comments tonight. I don't find that, I find very few theists are willing to be honest about what the text is and about what it says. Uh, I think that we're more prone to say, let's just pick up an English version, read it, and pretend like that this is what the ancients were saying and it's not that's what I and found. Um, I mean the the linguistic science uh, of today the anthropologist um, the paleontologist all of these people are working day in and day out and they have provided a much better reconstruction and now we can see something so much clearer and uh, it seems like the conversation these days isn't about being honest about what we actually have. And my question would be, from the standpoint of the atheistic community, why are atheists not approaching the text uh, in an authentic or an honest way? They probably don't realize, you see, you being so specialized on it, uh, and, and I never un understood a, a lot about it until I came here to these meetings and got to listen to some of these conversations. Uh, they probably don't don't realize how far that what they see as their King James Bible is removed from what was originally written down. Uh, after all, uh, until the print and press, we probably didn't have any two copies that were the same anyway. And until they started printing it out with the print and press, uh, the Bible. We probably had no no copies before that that would be unchanged. But but I guess my point is you have atheists who in a sense in this context would be abysmally ignorant as to what the text is. Well, would you, I, would you I, I think that the church folks deliberately obfuscate the, uh, the, the Bible's uh, 
history there so that you won't know what it means. Okay, but, but I'm trying to make a, a point in, in contrast here. We have atheists who, in a sense, are abysmally ignorant. And I'm talking about generally uh, about what the text says. But at the same time, we have theists who are equally right. that way. Right. And so we have two groups who are talking about something that they really don't know what they're talking about. And so my question is, why do we feel like this conversation out here needs to be going on? Why are people of science not coming back and saying, wow, that conversation doesn't even need to take place? The conversation that really needs to take place is through the eyes of true scientists, people who know how to look at the text. Well, I, I guess that we, we got... It, when it comes to the theists, you know, we've got the, the group that's trying to push their own envelope, you know, the young earth creationist folks, and they are not going to accept any other answer. And so it doesn't really matter what we come up with or uh, in science or in d discovery. Uh, after all, if they dug up some new Dead Sea Scrolls that, that, that showed, you know, opposite what they were teaching or believing in, they're going to ignore that too. Yeah. I, I believe it's just that they feel that their uh, little island that they stand on is rather isolated and so that they need to protect it at all costs. Yeah. I think you're right. Um, let me just give one little uh, comment um, or, or two questions. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry. This crazy update has got me squirreled around here. But, and I wanted to say this as well. Um, Daniel says, I think that theists also have a healthy respect for science. I don't think we give theists enough credit sometimes for using the scientific method. Um, I, th I think that's uh, becoming a trend in a sense in theism. I think you have a lot of theists who are jumping on board, that is, with good, solid science. In fact, I think that a large group of priests now believe in evolution. And that's also true with, you know, you can't find, in the Episcopal Church, you're not going to find one of those guys not believing no. uh, in evolution. And my, my point is, it depends on where you go. If you go over here to First Baptist Church, that guy doesn't believe in evolution. That's obvious. But if you go to, you know, certain places in theism, you know, that, that's true. Continue. Uh, I didn't mean the, and Daniel, again, which I really want you, Daniel, to uh, follow up on this and give us an example of, of where this transpired during this conversation. Uh, he says, is this really a legitimate atheist, theist discussion? Even the theists are bashing Christ. And I, if I have early onset Alzheimer's, you let me know because I, I can't recall, you know, and you and I are the lone theist up here. So, okay, Daniel, now, you know, give us a shout out and um, prove your point. If we have bashed Jesus Christ tonight as theists, um, I don't not, know not about at all. It. Yeah, and do you remember? I, I mean, sometimes really they do that. crazy things. And besides, uh, I mean, you can be a theist and not a Christian, so. Right. Yeah, uh, I, I but think it's illegitimate as to a, say uh, that. Kind of, since I own the group he's talking about, I should probably defend them a little bit. What? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> let, let, let me, let me, let, let, let me mm. make a statement before we go any further. I, you know, one of the things that I'm getting That's tired right, of, um, That's right. and I, it's not a complaint, but it's just something that I get tired of, Sometimes I will make statements about theistic models and modeling, and my words are just as legitimate as any of the texts that people read in the English Bibles, and yet theists will claim that um, these people, that is, in their English Bibles, were close to Jesus, and that's simply not true. Because what you're reading in your English Bibles is so synthetic. This is something that came many years later, and it's so far removed from anything Jesus said. It's 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 such a um, it's such nonsense, you know, to make the claims. Oh, these people are so much closer to Jesus. But 
you know, even the the apostle John in his right, he, he reads that even the people who were walking with him didn't have a clue as to what he was saying, mm -hmm. you know, to use their own text. But, you know, my point is from a textual uh, examination, you know, that, that doesn't make sense because I think that people fail to understand. In other words, we had a gentleman on our show the other day who claimed, oh, we have thousands of manuscripts mm -hmm. of the New Testament. Remember? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, that's that's very deceptive in a sense mm -hmm. to say that because, number one, you have no original writings. In other words, we don't have an autographer. We don't have an original writing of Paul or Matthew or Mark, Luke, John. We don't have any of those. Mm -hmm. So how many uh, manuscripts in the first century do we have? Uh, none. We had one uh, dated by Dr. young Koo Kim, and uh, he's a failed paleontologist. Now, I like him, but he failed to use good scientific methods and practices, and so that's out of there. And so uh, there's something that will be introduced within the next year, possibly, that will d be demonstrated that it's of the first century um, context, but it's not an autographer claim, uh, but it's simply um, just, just fragments, mm -hmm. uh, just a few words, if you will. Mm -hmm. And so when you look in the second century, how many manuscripts do we have? Just look at the data, just, you know, less than my fingers. Uh, and so look at the third century, very little. And so we don't have complete documentation of all the New Testament. The hundreds of manuscripts come late. In other words, you know, year 800, 900. And these are minuscule manuscripts and minuscule manuscripts um, they are a running style of Greek, which is actually an interpretation of the uncial form. And most people are not even aware of that. And so when these people start bragging like this, oh, we have thousands, what you have is you have thousands of copies that is in the category of a minuscule style writing that are actually an interpretation. Mm -hmm stress interpretation that can be flawed because the uncial manuscripts are all capital letters no spaces in between and there is a lot of discrepancy that's coming out within the next 10 to 20 years on the differences of how we can actually render or understand the uncials and so when people go and they start claiming the greek says this and that they are never reading from the uncials, they are always reading from the minuscules. And every text base to date is built upon the basics of the minuscule manuscripts, not the uncials, mm -hmm. which is well, troubling. Yes, sir. Even if we had an original provable, um, a letter from Paul to one of the churches, I mean, if we could verify it to the date, it's carbon dated, it's correct, we know the text was written in his hand, you could go, go through it, translate it to the best of your ability, and there's still going to be 45,000 different interpretations of exactly what's being said on that one piece of paper right in the original text. Not, not everybody's going okay, to agree with Not necessarily, with and, I, and I would agree with you. That no vowels did this. Okay, I, I, I would disagree with you there, uh, and, and here's why. For instance, there's a big difference between translating and interpreting. Hmm. Would you agree with that? Yes. Okay, so if, if you were a translator and, and you were very honest as a translator and said, listen, I'm going to use a particular model of translation theory. I'm not just going to give you a book and say this is the holy word of God. I'm simply going to give you a translation of a document that we know that we possess that came directly from Paul. This is not the word of God. This is simply... Paul's writing. That's all we put on it. And I'm going to give you a translation model, and I'm also going to let you know what this translation model is. So you wouldn't go too far with it. In other words, what I'm suggesting is the reason that we've gotten into all kinds of interpretations has to do with translators have not been honest enough to say this is the way that we translated it. This is the way that we modeled the text. I think my point is I'm going even a step further than that. I, I probably misused the word translation. Um, interpretation is what I should have said. If we had an agreed upon translation, you know the model, you know how it was, 
how it was uh, brought about, you know, even if it's 100% agreed upon that, okay, this is exactly the words that are on this page to the best of our ability to understand, one phrase can be perceived in a completely different way based on, you know, do they want to add a spiritual, you know, content, context to it? Do they, are, is it a, you know, is it, is there a divine reference? Well, the, 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 the question would be, if we used a scientific method in practice, mm. and if a translation model, in other words, uh, for instance, if I gave you a translation model and I said this is the model that we're, we're following, I'm giving you actually meta-language. Mm. And meta-language for the most part is going to be in determinate language usage. Now, if the determinate language is saying this is the way that the text was translated, but it was based upon a determinate mindset of something, you would look more closely to the text and there would be less interpretive values out of it. Do you see what I'm talking about? In other words, the reason that we have science books and we're not so much into the interpretive part of it, it's because there is so much determinate language used in the scientific field. And so if we're analyzing a dead language, one of the things that we would want to do as a translator is to say, to the, the community that's reading it, let's not lead the people into ambiguity. In other words, let's do the work appropriately to where they can understand and compare apples to apples. And that means that a translator would have to provide to that community something that would not lead to ambiguities. Unfortunately, what's happening in our translation modeling, translators are simply working and giving people just another extremely ambiguous language to work with. And that's inappropriate. That's failed to begin with. So, yes, you're right if a translator simply said, let's just provide people with an ambiguous text. I would agree with that. Well, that's my, ex- my example. But you be... can do something by bypassing that, by giving it a determinant. And if you gave it a determinant, that means that we would be restricted to see it based upon this particular modeling. Does that make sense? It does. Um, I think my example that I'm trying to get to um, is more like if you take a piece of poetry, written contemporarily. Right now, somebody wrote it you know, 10 years ago. Um, we can all read the language. Um, we know how it was written, when it was written, the time frame. We know the historical background of it and so forth. But yet, you know, 20 people could read it and come up with 20 different interpretations of the same thing, even if it's in their language, okay. even if, you know, technically right. correct. Right. But, but also, that's true in English. If we read mm-hmm. uh, in English poets, you know, well, work, uh, we, we can get various yeah. translations or interpretations, I should say, of that poet's work. And sometimes poetry is intended to be that way. Mm-hmm. You know, that, that's why mystery novels are are so sellable. It's because, you know, the reader has so many different options to go left and right. You don't want to write in something that's clear. You want to, you know, allow that reader to dream anything into it because it makes it more of a mystery. And so the same thing is true with poetry. And so a translator would treat poetry much different and allow a lot of interpretive things because uh, let's admit this, poets, uh, abstract art, for instance, it's not to be understood just one way, but it's, it should be much variegated. Would you agree with that? Yes. And so if, if the intention of the Apostle Paul was to hand to you abstract art or something that's much variegated, what's wrong with that? It's intended to be that way. Mm. And so I think that it can be done. I'm not saying that it, it's going to be done without uh, some awkwardness. Or, or something that would fail. But I'm simply saying that I think there is a way to r- provide modeling that would give us more of a basis of talk what those people were stating back then if we followed a better scientific method in practice. That's my point. I was going to say that uh, Eli Weasel's book, uh, Night, uh, was, had some mistranslations in it. And this was by, uh, written by someone who was still alive at the time. 
uh, spoke English and German and still was unable to provide a very accurate translation until time went on and uh, more, a better translation was available. Uh, but to get to, uh, I was saying I was going to defend the Gulf Coast free thinkers a little bit. Is, that, um, is this this person, Daniel Mann? Hmm? Um, when I made the comment, you were well, thinking he was part uh, of Well, James your... was talking about people bashing the oh, Bible. Back to that. And okay. uh, what I, I was going to say, two things. One is, is that uh, the Gulf Coast free thinkers is kind of a retreat for atheists as a way of getting away from people who, uh, and being able to get things off their chest that, normally they would not be able to say in a public setting and that can lead to some very inflamed language so uh, which you're would saying at, at church it's okay for theists to bash atheists and their books not no, well this isn't church dawkins uh, books and well this isn't church this is people who are quite often have been uh mistreated by religious people or by religious institutions who get together and uh kind of as a recovery method will explain what has happened to them or how they uh, will, some of them got became atheists after reading the Bible and saying that no, what they have been taught has been false and they'll go over it and that's one, of the, that's one of the topics that will come up. This is what they say is in their Bible. I have read the Bible, this is not in their Bible or, their interp or they say this but they leave out these pieces of the Bible too. And while you're right, it's not a very accurate translation or rendering of the text, this is still the version that is used most often by theistic people. Now, the uh, other thing I was going to say, too, uh, in regards to the way that uh, uh, atheists interact with theists, most of these people will not uh, behave the same way when they're, after they've gotten this out of their system. I mean, I'm sure we've all been, if you're with your friends or if you're with your coworkers and your bot, maybe your boss says something wrong or, you know, somebody said something rude to you or something, you get it out of your system and then you move on. And that's what a lot of it is, is getting it out of their system. After we have a meetup once, twice a month, you get it out of your system, whatever you want to talk about, and then you go on with your day. Hmm. Okay. Um, Daniel writes back, remember I said, give me an example. He sort of changes his tune a little bit, um, my opinion. And he says, um, I was trying to say that all sides are bashing traditional Christians. So maybe he was just quick on the draw when he, he wrote Christ and then he didn't. Okay. Yeah, that's probably what it was. Well, is that what you think it is? Yeah, I think he just left off. I don't think so. <laughs> I'm just joking. <laughs> just, but but he does. This is no heated up, baby. Heated. But he, he does say, "I wish you had someone there to defend the historic Christian position." Okay, because okay. I don't know how if far back would in like history tell, you know, he, he wants to go. Yeah. Thousand years, you know, for century, uh, Abraham. No, please. Antioch, I'm just glad I don't know. that we live at a time that they don't burn us for what we talk about right yeah, now. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> it but wasn't that long ago that we couldn't be having this conversation. That, that, that's that true. true. You uh, know, one, one of the things that my wife and I keep being blamed for. We don't want to for, bash anybody. Uh, so many people are saying, wow, you're allowing atheists to come on the show. Well, atheists want to come on the show. And I'll be honest with you, we've had so many people lined up that were coming our way who wanted to be on the show and yada, yada, yada. And then when they found out that uh, we would ask them questions, and I'm talking about theists, they, they declined. And then others would say, well, give us a list of questions because we don't want you to an ask any more questions than the list that you've provided. And then it became, you know, just extremely ridiculous. And so here is our welcome our invite. If you are a Christian and you believe in historical Christianity, we'd love to have you on the love show. Love to, love to. And so we and welcome we'll not bash you. Bash bash you. you. But we will and ask questions. We don't believe in bashing, and so um, maybe I'm taking more offense than I should because we, we, we try so hard to portray that, you know, as a non-bashing, non-judgmental, you know, if you want to come up here and believe in uh, a little green man that came to your home yesterday and he really gave you some good information, we'll let you say it. And I might roll my eyes or snicker, but 
we're not going to bash you for it. You know, we may, like I said, snicker, but I hope that, you know, the bashing part is the part that, you know, and hurt me. Um, right. In okay. fact, right now they can actually Skype in, uh, put the address up. Yeah, we'll be glad to let you defend. You can be on the show this, right now. Right now. You don't now. have to wait. You can right. be up here right now. Uh, while we're waiting on someone to Skype in to defend the historic Christian position okay well just message in the Ustream chat right just please put your handle in the Ustream chat and we will have you on the show right now right now as we can defend, enjoy some of your comments defend away uh, also a few minutes left. I want to get this in too because um Robin who actually tried to get into the Google Hangout on Wednesday uh, she makes a comment, and we we saw your picture up and down, and we didn't get uh, you in there. I think you were trying to um, get your microphone working, but she says, that's what I like about NCG, looking beyond labels to the human being. And another commenter, um, I'm going to get the name really screwed up, but uh, Lutius... What, well, I wouldn't have spelled it that way, but I guess they do. Okay, Lutius, Lucius, excuse me. Atheists don't approach the text in an authentic way because theists don't treat it that way. You're on to something, Lucius. Mm. Atheists treat the text as theists understand it. <sighs> My nose is starting, I'm sorry. It's how theists treat the Bible and politics and science that concern atheists. And he says, speaking gen generally, of course, in my experience. And I think you're exactly right. Um, good comment. You have something, James, to add to? I agree with that completely. Yeah, yeah. I think yeah. so. I, I think one of the biggest things that uh, atheists have a problem with as far as Christians, as far as the you know, confrontation between the two, it's not so much those that really have a, an understanding or truly study the Bible. I mean, we have our you know, debates with them. But the biggest thing that aggravates atheists are the ones who don't even know what's in the book that they're preaching or ab er, talking about. Right. They're, there's a line in a song by a group called, uh, or two girls called um, Garfunkel and Oates, uh, but it's something to the effect of, I believe what I am told, to, what the Bible tell, what people tell me the Bible tells me, you know. You know, my dad told me the Bible says this, so I believe that that's right. Doesn't mean, you know, they've never gone there to back it up themselves. Mm -hmm. right. They've never put the effort in. It's just, you know, I've been being told this forever, so, hey, it's the truth. No, I are, actually have a different one for that, which is uh, my big frustration is the people who will, find, will do amazing mental gymnastics to justify the rape, the murder, the genocide, the just horrible morality of the Old Testament. And uh, that, to me, is what frustrates me. It, it, they cannot, they don't have the ability for themselves to say, yes, that was a bad thing. Because if you don't, if you cannot say, yes, that was a bad thing, then you're saying there are conditions where genocide, rape, and murder are absolutely fine. Well, I, I will take it a step women. further. Exactly. I will take it a step further. It's, there's no way that you can justify the rape justify the genocide, infanticide, and slavery that's in the Old Testament or even in the New. Um, but I would go a step further and say that there's no way to justify Yahweh. Mm. You're talking about a maniacal monster. Mm -hmm. And for some reason, Christianity wants to model uh, you know, Yahweh as, as the one that Jesus has to satisfy, in a sense. And, and some people in Christianity want, want to make Yahweh one and the same as Yeshua HaMashiach, uh, which I find that to be uh, spurious. But, the, you know, um, to give it to them, you know, there is a certain rendering of the Hebrew text that would argue that way. But um, I, I think that it would be a spurious notion to think that we could mm -hmm. bank on that as, mm -hmm. as actually something that would be reliable. But uh, I would like to get your final comments tonight about uh, the New Covenant group because we're trying to build a sense of community. This is fun. And uh, people keep asking us questions like, why are all those people 
uh, in Pensacola and even in New York, like Bob Graves and, and Greg Bray, you know, all of these people wearing beards. There's something weird <laughs> with that. And so it's kind of strange. But, but Daryl just has the, like the, what do you call that? That long? Handlebar mustache. It's not a handlebar. He must be, Fu Manchu. He must go both kind ways of. then. Yeah, <laughs> Fu Manchu. Yeah, he's only <laughs> Fu Manchu man. Okay. Uh, but Randy, let's start with you. What are your thoughts about the New Covenant Group? Is it going to work, that is, in building the kind of community that we really need to go A to Z with things? Well, from what I've seen in the short period of time that I've been involved, uh, it is building support. It's, I don't, generally don't go out and have conversations with people that are, you know, identify themselves as theists. I don't avoid it. But I don't go, you know, I don't go to church to have a conversation with anybody. Here, I'm hearing your viewpoints, your perspectives. Um, I learn a lot. And any day that you're, you know, learning something is a good day. And I think it's, I think it's great. I think your model, um, I saw your little advertisement on Facebook about um, unchurching. And I think that's amazing. Yeah, we want to try to unchurch as many people as possible. And I'm not going to... Uh Yes. Uh, what time do we have? Okay, we have two minutes left. Uh, I tell you what, just bring him on. Let us say hi to him, and then we'll have him on the show in, in the future. Um, okay, Michael, your final thoughts. Well, my final thoughts. Uh, well, uh, since you're talking about unchurching, I'd like to go ahead and plug our group, the Humanist of West Florida, which is a secular group intended to help the community. We're looking for new members, and anybody is welcome. Uh, but Can I ask you a question about yes. humanists? How many humanists get together and feed lots of the homeless people and the people who are hungry? That is what we're... Well, in general, a lot of humanist groups do that kind of work. We're uh, just getting started, and we're going to be working with the Bay Area Food Bank that's good. Uh, to do so. We don't have a date scheduled just yet, but that's definitely one of the projects we're going to be working on. And not just the homeless, but also kids who do not get uh, adequate food during the school year when, uh, or outside of the school year. Uh, there are many poor kids from poor housing that they only the only time they get yeah. adequate food is when they go to school. Yeah. So we're going to be working on a project where we will be giving them food or providing them food uh, during the summer break. Now, That's anything great. that we can do to support that, feeding children is so important to my wife and myself. Uh, wow, just get us involved in that. We want to be so involved in that. Honey? Um, you know, I'm excited that um, that Daniel wants to get on and, and yeah. give his position. That's great. And um, I think everybody's enriched tonight with uh starting with the the big bang outside and uh, <laughs> maybe it wasn't the big bang but it was it was nice i really enjoyed it so james are you glad you brought the, your tesla coil oh i love playing with the tesla <laughs> coil and the uh, arcs and spark show is is always a high point of my evening uh i was running it one day uh, many years ago and i heard a couple of whispers out of the bushes and they these couple little little kids were high on their bellies had crawled under the bushes were like hey he's gonna run it again and i said you guys can come over here it's okay mm. now when you got shocked a while ago did it hurt oh absolutely yeah. uh, <laughs> uh, the, uh, the tesla coil uh you really shouldn't let it go through you because it's got a lot of dc in it uh whereas wow. the ac part of it flows over the surface of your skin yeah. Uh, oh, yeah, that was real painful. Like I say, it probably cured my arthritis. <laughs> yeah, it looked like one of your shoes came off. Oh, I took my shoe off so I'd be grounded. Uh, if I was standing on my flip-flops, the potential would build up in me, and then it would flash from my foot to the ground and burn my foot. Good Lord. So I took my flip-flop off on purpose so I'd be grounded. Did you hear that, Jack? I thought you stepped in I cat mean, crap. Next time we film you. him, you need to take your <laughs> shoes off. I mean, we're standing on holy ground when we're next to James. That is scary. I mean, this is holy or, or ground. Unholy yes. ground. Unholy. I mean, wow. Uh, this is amazing. Do we have Daniel on? Daniel. Daniel. Oh, too bad. Hey, well, Daniel, you know what? Um, you're more than welcome on any show. We'd love to have you. Love to hear your position. Yes. Won't bash you. Don't believe in it. And if we have tonight, we are absolutely sorry.
That goes for the atheists, too. We agree. Yeah. And it goes for all these. <laughs> we'll argue. We're not bashing. We're just arguing. That's right. And then afterwards, we'll we, we'll get we you will argue something. with you. Michael needs to promise that he will show his boots off again. Okay, I'm sorry. I don't mean to. I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we've had fun tonight, though. Yeah, we've had an enjoyable night tonight, and we're going to come back and do this again Wednesday night. Hopefully you will join uh, the master at work. That would be Bob Graves. He's unreal. He's the unconventional pastor, and his show has been uh, Everybody Loves Phil. It's an amazing uh, kind of show, and I think that uh, if you really want to learn how to form meaningful relationships, I think it's a show that you don't want to miss. And I think that's going to be good Wednesday night. We also have the Cult of Honesty right after it. And if you want to get involved in the Google Hangout, and Daniel, you'd be more than welcome there. Uh, come and, and share what you think to be true and get to know all of the people. And once again, we're going to give a shout-out for Alex Botton. He's doing a wonderful job doing many shows during the week. And also, I think it's Jim Gardner. Uh, he's... He's excellent. I, I like his radio voice approach. He, he does an awesome job. And also Dr. Matt Hunt. Um, I can't wait to get him on the show. I want to find out more about these subatomic particles. And you may know something about the subatomic particles. And he was getting ready to introduce us to the idea of how it actually uh, doesn't work so much in concert with the the logical position of the law of non-contradiction, if I'm understanding him properly. Uh, when, we, when, we, when we get down to the quantum level, things things change, and uh, it's like uh, Stephen Hawking said: uh, nothing is so silly as quantum's, and nothing more explains the problem. Yeah, but um, I'm looking. He's a mathematician and physicist, if I'm not mistaken. And also, um, there's another gentleman, M MK what? MK Skeptic. MK Skeptic. He, he was very good in, in, in logic. Uh, and so we want to give those guys a shout out. Uh, those guys are doing an excellent job. And so thank you so much for being with us tonight. This has been The Place. And so, honey, tell everyone good night. Good night, everybody. We'll see you next week at the place. Take care. <laughs>